thanks for joining in. I hope you had a great time yesterday on a boat party while I was preparing my slides. So just a side note from organizers, there is this website called Slido, which you can use to ask me any question you want. So my name is Stefan and I'm born and raised here at Novi Sad, Serbia. As far as organizers of this conference told me, I'm the youngest speaker this year. So I'm a front-end engineer at a company called Instana. Apart from that, I also organize a Novi Sad JS meetup group here in Novi Sad. We usually host like one event per month with two talks each and there is like nice food and drinks afterwards with a perfect networking. So if you didn't have a chance yet, I highly suggest you visit us. And people mostly know me for my open source contributions. So these are some projects that I have created in the last year or two. The most popular one is definitely the 30 seconds of code, which was the nominated as sixth fastest growing open source project in 2018. So I won't brag too much about it. If you want to check it out, I'll be speaking at GitHub Universe in San Francisco this November. So you can hear the, hear the whole story about the whole organization and all of the projects. So today we are here to talk about accessible JavaScript applications. It is a very important and sensitive topic and I'm going to show you different JavaScript patterns that you can use in order to make your web applications accessible. So before we even start, like how many of you do even know like what accessibility is? Raise your hand if, wow, <laughs> okay. So like according to Oxford Dictionary, for those of you who don't know, the accessible means the quality of being easily reached, enter or used by people who have a disability. So it basically means that people who have disabilities should be able to do everyday things that people without any physical or mental disorder do. So for example, if you think a bit, some modern cities already provide fully accessible public spaces, transportation, infrastructure, facilities and services. But what about technology? You probably never thought how people with disabilities, visual impairments, hearing loss or any other disorder use the technology and it's pretty common these days. So for example, my uncle, he is blind from birth but he released a book this year, finished bachelor's degree and he uses his P PC on a daily basis. So it's pretty common these days and if the moral side of the things isn't enough to convince you about accessibility, there is even a legal side about it. So a year ago, a blind man couldn't order a pizza from Domino's. So he sued a company and Domino's wanted to fight the Supreme Court to say that their website doesn't have to be accessible. And I think the fine was for like $40,000. So like what would you do in that situation if you were Domino's? Would you fight one person or make that web application accessible to millions of people? So about 15% of the world population is estimated to have some form of disability. And I know it's like a very huge number, but World Health Organization that did this research also included elderly people, people with lower vision and a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, it's roughly 1 billion of people that you might miss potentially. So what types of disabilities exist? There are many types of them. And unfortunately, because of the time, today I'm going to cover visually impaired people. Those are the blind persons or people with very low vision. I'm going to cover physically impaired people or people who are unable to use the standard input methods for the technology. Also, I'm going to cover cognitively impaired people. Those people include the ones with mild to severe dyslexia, as well as attention deficit and information processing disorder. And last but not least, I'm going to cover auditory impaired people. Those are the ones who are completely deaf or they are partially deaf, so they have to wear hearing aids. So you're probably asking yourself at this point, like how people with disabilities use the technology. So on every, on every operating system, you have this accessibility menu. So for example, this one is the macOS accessibility menu. There are different tools that people with disabilities can use. So the most important one is definitely the voiceover, which is a screen reader. It's a tool that reads everything that is on the screen in a meaningful way to a user, like from top to bottom. There are also like system-wide zoom for visually impaired users as well, captions for people who cannot hear and a bunch of other stuff. So it's important to know that every operating system has them and basically people without disabilities are able to use the technology without so much problems. But at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what is the problem? So, I mean, operating systems are meant to be fully accessible because they have built-in technologies to support that. But what about like your web applications and websites? So 10 years ago, when our websites were static HTML content, there were perfectly accessible. Like all you needed to do is to take care of color contrast, font sizes and your content and you would be good to go. 
but nowadays, as we write JavaScript applications that are rendered on client side, the accessibility problem is much more bigger, so I'm going to cover all the problems now and solutions for them. So first of all, we'll have a uh, most common group of people which are visual impaired users. Uh, as we saw earlier, uh, they use screen readers, and a screen reader is a specialized application dedicated to read out loud text on the screen. So this is how they see your web application when they're using it. And I'm going to play a short recording of just random insert from screen reader, so. Are currently on a pop-up button. To display a list of options, press caps lock, space. Play unseen stories button. Link, Armada JS, JavaScript conference. You are currently on a heading level five. Link, seven slash 18 slash 19, one, oh nine PM, July 18th. Public button. See translation button. Show more information about this link button. Show more in link. Lucas de Coaster, a font introduction to Lambda Calculus. Buy tickets button. You are currently on a six link button. Leaving toolbar. You and five others, you and five others, you and five others button. You are current Stefan Pages, L like, selected toggle button. You are love toggle button. Ha toggle button. Wow toggle button. You are currently on a toggle button, comment button, main. Link. So does anybody have an idea like what is web pages? It's not, it's like the announcement from Facebook page. So actually the screen reader was reading out loud those little boxes over there that you can like, like, love, wow, and a bunch of other emotions. So as you can see, it's pretty frustrating for them. And like Facebook is fully accessible, so this is like the best as you can get in terms of accessibility. Now imagine how frustrating it would be for somebody to hear your inaccessible website. So it's a pretty huge problem. So. As I said, they use devices called screen readers. Every operating system has them. And it's good to know that several commercial solutions exist as well. So for example, on Windows, we have a screen reader called JAWS and the license for it costs 1000 bucks. And it's just licensed for like one version for one computer. So like when there is a new version, you need to pay 1000 bucks more in order to get it. So you cannot rely on having the latest and greatest technology for those people. So on average, like the average screen reader can read all the text that is visible on a page. It can also read some text that is not visible on a page. So for example, like alt attributes and images. It can list all headers and links so the user can navigate more easily throughout a page. And yeah, some can, but others cannot read text based on CS layout, CSS layout. So basically how screen readers work is they use your DOM tree and they convert it to something called accessibility tree, which is very much the same as the DOM tree, and they go from top to bottom in the logical order and read out the content. So if your HTML is not in the logical order and you use like CSS Flexbox and grid to make it look nice, the screen readers might not be able to resolve that content for the user. And they can also not read text or images, text on the images or images, so you need to take care of that as well. So probably the only thing that everybody in this room knows is the alt attribute. So you use it to describe what is happening on the image. So for example, right here is the description of this image on Twitter. And there are a good few rules that you should follow in writing alt attributes. So first of all, like n always set it, even if you are not sure like what an image is and how to describe it, always set it at least to like be empty. Because if you don't set alt attribute, the screen reader will actually read the source of the image. So imagine nowadays when images are hosted on S3 buckets on AWS and there is like that huge URL, the screen readers will always read it. So like always set it. If the image is for decorative purposes, leave it blank like this. And for the perfect user experience, you can put a period in the end. So it actually it would make the screen reader stop at the end of the sentence and it would then continue with the other content. So several applications because of like content is user uploaded were not able to catch up with this, so needed they needed a way to like generate alt attributes automatically. And that is completely possible. So for example, how can we get the description of this image? So with use of computer vision algorithms, we can send our image to like services from Google, IBM, or Microsoft, and they would return us a pretty extensive JSON. And inside of that JSON, there is like this caption field that has text and confidence inside it. So basically text is a description of that image while the confidence is a number from zero to one and the greater that number is, the more accurate the, the algorithm is to give you the right alt attribute. So that is basically all you need to know about accessible images. With this, you can basically use 
alt text on every image. So this is how like Instagram works, Facebook, Twitter, all of them use this technique in order to make every image on the web accessible. So they do not have engineers in the background writing alt text manually for your every image. So next on our list, we have navigation. And it's pretty advanced topic, and it requires a lot of effort to make it fully accessible. So I'll focus on JavaScript parts today only, and we'll briefly mention the navigation basics. So if you have a feeling of the problems we we so people with disabilities have. So for example, this is how modern navigation works. We have a navigation component that is basically a static, and you can change the route on it. And once you change the route, only the part in the container changes and the screen reader is not able to catch up with that because like they're used to having the static HTML content served from the servers and they only read the content once there is a full page reload or there is a URL that's changed. So one thing we need to do is to announce the change to a screen reader. We basically need to say something like, okay, screen reader, there is the new content, focus on it and read just that. So we can do so with uh, this component, for example. It has a lab, uh, attribute called area live, which is basically going to tell the screen reader, okay, whenever this part of the content is inserted to the page or it changes, the screen reader should read it. And uh, area live basically can have two values. So one is polite and the other one is assertive. So when it's set to polite, the screen reader will actually wait to uh, read everything that it wanted to do, and then it's going to announce that change. So for example, it's useful for like non-important notifications or if the user just added an item to their cart. And it can be also set to assertive, which will mean the screen reader will stop immediately and is going to read the new content. So that would be, when set to assertive, that would be a good use case for the navigation. And next we have this attribute called area atomic, which can be set either to true or false. So when there is new content inserted, if the area atomic is set to true, the screen reader will read the whole content from top left of, of the your website. And, it's if, and if it's set to false, the screen reader will just read the newly changed content. So for example, like this is the component that you can use in React to announce changes like notifications, page reroutes and whatever. So you can take picture of it if you want to. So next on our list, we have page titles. So the screen reader doesn't announce page titles when the route changes, but imagine like the regular user flow of a average user, they go to one tab, they go to another, then they come back to your application. So it's always good for them to know where they are because the screen reader actually reads the first thing they read is the page title. So this is like a Vue.js snippet that you can use to change the title of your web page. There is also like equivalent of React with using uh, hooks and maybe lifecycle methods, or you can use packages like uh, React Helmet and Vue Helmet that even have more advanced things inside of them. So next on our list, we have skip links. So you've seen how screen readers work. They read basically everything in order. So for example, imagine our regular news website, the screen reader will actually have to read like the logo and that huge navigation and then some random content until the user can actually start reading the news. So you can leverage like this skip link, which is invisible button that when focused with the screen reader can allow users to skip to main content. So how would that work? Basically you have a button and once it's selected with tab, the screen reader will actually announce it's like a skip to main content button. And here is the example of it. So when I press tab, you see it up there, you press it and it's, it focuses the main content of the page. So that is really useful for some bigger websites. It's have like a huge navigation and a bunch of images at the top of it. So next on our list, we have physically impaired users. As I said, those users include the ones who cannot use the standard mouse input to navigate across application. So instead they usually use the keyboard only input or some other specialized input devices like switches, which are basically buttons that when pressed in some order mimic the keyboard press. So for them, it's important to have your reachable custom elements fully accessible. They use tab spaces, escape and arrow keys to go throughout your page and they should have visible focus styles. So th that focus style is that actually blue outline that we have around component when we select it via the mouse or the keyboard. So your custom element should have the tab index on it and it doesn't make your element accessible by default. So in order to make it uh, focusable, you need to set tab index to zero. So it will actually focus it in the regular tab order. You can set it to minus one, which means that the user won't be able to see it, but you can focus it via JavaScript later on. So I will show you an example of that 
in a bit, and it can also be set to any positive number from like one to I don't know how many, but it's actually going to change the default tab order of users client and it's not very good and it's not recommended to hijack their tabs index so I wouldn't suggest doing it. So apart from like tab index you see there is that blue outline that everybody hates and the first thing that you probably do on your project is that you remove it via CSS which is equivalent of removing the mouse cursor for regular users. So there is a way actually to display it only when we are using the mouse. Actually there is a way to hide it when we're using the mouse and there is a way to remove it when it's when we are using the mouse. So basically like this is the snippet. You would have one variable mouse down and you would listen for mouse down and mouse up events. And whenever we detect like the person is using the mouse in order to go around the page, we'll remove that blue outline. But if they're not using the mouse, we will just show the blue outline around the element. So as I mentioned, like tab index is not enough. So we need to introduce something called accessible rich internet applications. So those are the, this is the standard that makes your custom elements fully accessible to assistive technologies. So it can make them basically fully accessible. It exposes some information to like screen readers and other uh, technologies that would make it accessible for the end user. So this is like example of role equals to button, which would indicate that your custom component is a button and there is a label for it. So whenever a screen reader encounters it, it's going to read that label. So I, this is a very good example of it. So most people usually, when they don't want to use like the default HTML button, they use like a div and then they attach some event listener on it and then they are done. But like in this case, it's not focusable and people with disabilities cannot interact with them if they're using just the keyboard. So on the my right hand side, there is actually a example of really good implemented uh, button. So you would need to have tab index in order to select it. Actually, it would have a role of a button and label to go along with that role. And there is actually a uh, event handler for it. So like the, if you want to have the custom element, you need to have tab index, role for it, label, some other area attributes that we are going to see in a minute and also an event handler. And even better solution is to use built-in HTML components, but once you cannot use them, it's this formula below how to make them fully accessible. So next on our list, we have uh, keyboard traps and modals. So basically here is an example of one inaccessible modal. So I'll play the video and then we'll discuss like what is good about it and what is not. So when we press the open model button, the model opens, but take a look at the focus. It's right behind the model. So whenever user tabs, they can still focus behind the model. Once they go into the model, they cannot close it via escape and stuff. So there are a lot of problems with this model because people who use the keyboard only are not able to interact with the page. So when we speak about accessible models, they should be closed when we press escape key or when we click the, that gray out outlay behind them. They should also toggle area hidden attribute on model. So for example, the way we implement models is we usually append them to a page or we hide them at first and then show them once we press that button. So the screen reader actually reads all the content in the DOM tree. So it's going to read that model as well, even if it's not present. So in order to say to the screen reader, hey, don't read this content, we have to set its area hidden to true. So we also should maintain focus position before and after toggling the model. So when we open the model and when we go through it and when we close it, the focus should be set to that button that we use to open it instead of somewhere randomly on the page. And it should also focus the first focusable element within the model. So like you saw in the example, this focus went behind the model. It's very bad practice. So we should like focus the model itself. And we last but not least, we have to introduce something called keyboard trap to focus within the model. So remember the tab indexes I have told you about. We can set the tab index to minus one whenever we open a model. So only the content inside of the model is focusable. So when we use the tabs and shift tab in order to move, we can just mo uh, navigate throughout the model and not the behind the page. So next we have cognitively impaired users. And unfortunately there isn't a lot that you can do with JavaScript to them. So some improvements include like typography and justified text, which will make them read and understand your content better. 
and we actually need to have like shorter sentences and paragraphs and this is also good for user experience so for foreign speakers they also appreciate shorter sentences and paragraphs in order to understand your content better however there is one thing we can do with javascript and that is ability to turn on and off animations so all of us love animations but some people with medical conditions are not able to focus on the content and on the important forms when we have animations on our website so we would need to turn them off so the way they do so is they go to the settings and they reduce the they turn on the reduce motion uh, setting on and we can listen for that with uh, match media function which will actually tell us if the user prefers animations or not so if they do we will just leave the animations on and if they don't we can turn them off via javascript so this is useful for uh, javascript animations the same can be done with the uh, CSS animations because it's a media query so we can just select it in our CSS styles and last on our list we have auditor impaired users so there isn't much to do about them as well in terms of JavaScript like we would just need to make the interactive features with visual alerts so for example when you send a notification don't just include the uh, audio alert for it introduce some like visual animation so they can notice that they get just got notification and we should focus on videos with good captioning so a lot of companies that generate the subtitles dynamically use this technique so basically they extract the video from the they extract the audio from the video file they send it to a google cloud service called uh, text to actually speech to text and it's going to output a web vtt format which we can use in our videos to have like custom captioning so there is a good example of the company I currently work for which is this custom video editor it can append custom subtitles to each video and it just uses the, this technique I showed you so last but not least we have like temporary disabilities and disabilities do not always have to be permanent or ongoing sometimes your environment or circumstances can create a temporary disability so for example on this image we have the New York subway and you're probably thinking so okay what with them so it's pretty crowded and it's pretty noisy so people cannot rely on their audio so instead they really appreciate captions on your image it or captions on your videos so it's basically the same for auditor impaired user he also appreciates the captions on your videos so you see there is like a parallel between people with disabilities and people who are just having temporary disabilities because of the situation they're in even a better example is this so we have a comparison between permanent temporary and situational disability so for example for the keyboard users we have a person who has only one arm so he's not able to use all the input methods that are available to us the same would be for the uh, person who has an arm injury so they're not able to use the standard input devices as well and the same might be useful for the new parents who are holding their newborn baby they still have one hand to operate the technology and below you can see the example for uh, visual impaired users so we have like a blind person who is not able to see at all we have a person who is suffering from cataract which is he's also not able to see the screen and then we have like a distracted driver so you get a point of it so actually there are a few features that started as accessibility initiatives and they turn to like regular lives of ourselves so for example this type ahead feature on the keyboard it's not actually a feature that was meant for people without disabilities instead it was meant for people who had a really bad physical impairment so they could write faster with it and people really loved it so they introduced it to like every phone we use nowadays which is really useful for, for all of us so when we think about good user experience in 2019 there are actually a lot of stuff that need to be covered so the websites should be loaded instantly they should be really fast usable with a keyboard they should have a really good color contrast so we can use them in the direct sunlight they should work also in the low light environment and if you just think a bit it's really associated with accessibility so for example like having a website with a cool color contrast means that people with who are visually impaired or have like really low vision they can still see your website better and also for people who are standing outside in the direct sunlight they can also see your website and they would appreciate it the same would like be for the using the website with a keyboard and a bunch of other stuff like this list is very huge so i'm not going to cover all of it but you get it and it's not like hard to tell a story about accessibility it's hard to make uh, everyone believe that story so for me like accessibility is more than giving a people with disabilities access to something 
it's actually a ease of use for everybody and like better user experience. So therefore, like accessibility shouldn't stop creativity, innovation, and design. Instead, it should be part of it. So my advice for today would be to start with small tweaks that will make a huge impact on your website accessibility. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I guess this is the section for questions, if we have any. So, so guys, I see. I see that there are uh, quite a few questions. Okay. Uh, let's start. If some part of your application renders uh, in an iframe, how does that impact accessibility? Ooh, as far as I know, like iframes are pretty much inaccessible. So the only like thing you could do is actually enter that iframe and go into the website. And then actually the accessibility would depend on how that website is implemented. So that would be it. Okay. Uh, can you share the slides? Uh? I can do that. I will do that on my Twitter account, I guess, in 15 minutes. So it's this one here. OK. Uh, are there screen readers for mobile phones? Yeah, they are. So basically, you can go to like settings panel on your iPhone on or Android phone. So I didn't mention that, yeah. But also, like for physically impaired users and visually impaired users, you can actually go to settings and turn this both screen reader on and a lot of different assistive technologies. So because like based on research, like 70% of people use mobile phones instead of desktops and laptops. So there definitely are. And people with disabilities use them a lot. Uh, where does one start with making an existing application accessible? Uh, where does one start? Or uh, with making an existing application accessible. Well, you actually start with writing the semantic HTML first, because actually the HTML will make your uh, application fully accessible by default. If you introduce some JavaScript to it, just be sure to use this, these tips that I've sh shown you. So you can actually take a better look at area attributes that I mentioned. So there is like hundreds of them and they're used to make your components accessible. And last but not least, you have to test it somehow. So the obviously the best way is to give a disabled user your application to test it and give you the direct feedback. But since that's not always possible, there are tools like Lighthouse, which you can run audit on your website and they're going to output some bad practices that you've done on your, your website. There are also like uh, Babel plugins for accessibility that you can use for your React applications. And there are different extensions that you can use in order to test the accessibility of your web app. And what about issues that come with uh, different browsers and their handling? Mm, it's not about uh, issues about the browsers. It's actually the only issue is about the screen reader itself. So like the more advanced the screen reader is, the better it will consume the content. But as far as I know, there isn't, uh, I mean, every browser supports accessibility by default. So all the area attributes that you will see working basically everywhere. So it's not a huge problem. OK. Uh, there are there any sources where people can see uh, the things that they, sh they should write regarding uh, accessibility? Mm, yeah, there is something called Ali Project. So Ali is basically a number name for the accessibility, so A11W. So the website is called Ali Project. It has a bunch of blog posts about accessibility and things and how you can improve accessibility on a website. There is also a little page that I made called webaccessibility.guide, which is a collection of short summarized accessibility tips that you can start using today. And there is also like Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit, which is a website that shows how people with disabilities use the web. And it can actually show you what mistakes you're making and how to solve them. I think that's it. And there is also like a book from O'Reilly. It's called, I think, Web Accessibility, basically just Web Accessibility. And it's really good. It's about like 170 pages, and I learned a lot from it. OK, and what would you say? How much of an overhead is in percent when trying to make something accessible? There is a lot, actually. So you, cannot n you can never go like fully accessible. So for example, the few websites that I've seen are like Twitter, Facebook, and those big social media companies because they have to comply with legal actions. So their websites need to be fully accessible, for, but for like average web app, you should aim as high as possible in order to make it as much accessible as you can. So there is not like upper limit for that. Okay, and what about the, uh, the language is different than English? Well, screen readers work in different languages, so that's okay. And like 
you should provide internalization also on your website, but that's a topic for, I guess, another time. It's important to know that like screen readers work for every language and people who do not understand English can also use it in some different major language. I think it's even exists for like Serbian language, so it's pretty much advanced, yeah. Okay. Uh, is there some automated uh, service that tests your app for uh, or components for accessibility? Yeah, there are a lot of like NPM packages that can do that, do, do that for you. There is one called X. There is also like Lighthouse CLI that you can use to test for accessibility and basically just search for them. There are dozens of them. Okay, and uh, should we try, I think this is the last one for today, should we okay. try to implement our own text-to-speech solutions in our apps? For example, with Amazon Poly, or should we leave that job to screen reader within the OS? So, could you repeat that? I didn't get it quite well. So, should we try to implement our own text-to-speech solutions in our apps, or should we leave that to, uh, to, to, a, scr uh, to a screen reader within the... Well, the only thing you would need to use that is actually for videos in order to generate the... Uh, custom captioning for everything else like the screen reader will take care of it including the images so you're pretty much good to go with just the screen reader there is no need to experiment with AWS services and that stuff okay thank you thank you